I left you with a question last time we were together. It had to do with Augustine's view of free will. And the question was... It's not a complete sentence, Mr. Gore. <laughs> That's true, it wasn't. You're going to have to help me out. And since, Avery, you're the first one that spoke up, what was the rest of that uh, sentence that I started to... Uh, just kind of slipping, I can't recall. What was it? What was the question? The question that Augustine, well, the question I left in your <coughs> minds, at least I tried to, <coughs> that I said we'd return to bright and early Monday morning, and I wanted you to think about it nonstop over the entire Thanksgiving break, which I'm sure most of you did, and it was, forget it. Sheely, forget it. Yes, Megan? You asked what's an example of choosing that which we do not want. To okay, choose. that's right. Augustine has the idea of choice. We are, a, we are aware that we are able to choose. Choosing is part of, you know, being alive. You have chosen to come to class. Some of you may think, yeah, but I didn't really want to go. Coming to class in philosophy is an example, you might say, of choosing against my stronger preferences. Right? That's her. You're laughing at her. I don't know what. Spencer's over there laughing at something. What would it be? Uh, Matthew, I, my guess is that, that all things being equal right now, you would let me just be honest, you would prefer to be in the gym shooting hoops than sitting here in philosophy listening to me. Right? Mm, I'm liking philosophy. That's <laughs> <laughs> kind of my favorite part of the day, actually. Okay, thank you. That's a very, very <laughs> nice, hypocritical answer you gave me there. But how about uh, Spencer? I just want an honest answer. Okay, thanks. You know, we got one honest man. Diogenes is going around looking for an honest man, and whoa, there he is. So here's the question. You know, Spencer has choice number one: hoops. Choice number two. Well, no, we'll be a little more personal about it. <laughs> Gore! <laughs> okay? That's a choice. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Spencer, you know, 10 minutes ago, I was in the gym. It's empty. You could be in there right now. You could be in there shooting hoops. I mean, I suppose Mr. Williams might come strolling through eventually or something, but, you know, I mean, the fact is, Spencer has made a choice, and isn't this an example of choosing against his stronger preference because he would prefer to be in the gym shooting hoops, but in fact, he's chosen to be here. So doesn't that defeat Augustine's hypothesis that we always choose according to our strongest preference, right? Look at this. Oh, man. And it's like they're together. <laughs> Well, Nicole, isn't that sweet? I know. It was just kind of romantic. <laughs> well, Nicole, you, uh, you were certainly demonstrating a, a, a certain degree of uh, emphatic conviction there. Why? You're, you're prepared to support Augustine at this point. You're going to speak in his behalf. Go ahead, please. Say it's, um, we're not going against our preference because we know that well, we need a good education and that's way more in our minds than the fun of shooting hoops. Well, Nicole, look, I know that applies to you, but we're talking about Spencer. You know, I mean, how much does he care about a good education? Let's face it. <laughs> you, think that, you think that's what's going on in Spencer's mind too? He actually would prefer, you see, so the, it becomes a little bit more, doesn't it? It's not simply that Spencer has chosen gore over hoops. He's chosen a broader complex of things. It may be a good education. I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt there. But what might even be a more practical reason that he's here and not here? 
So, uh, Avery, go ahead. You were going to say something. Good. I think it would be uh, his honor to his duties, like he, okay. he was told to come here, and so. All right. I was kind of thinking about that. So if he went and did hoops instead, what might that mean? What what might come of that? Alicia, go ahead. Well, his parents did get mad at him. That's right. And so maybe, see, maybe in the ordinary course of events, Spencer would rather be shooting hoops, but he sees that there are negative consequences here that'll be painful, and positive consequences here, maybe, that will be preferable. And so his choice is not simply a choice superficially between those two, but against what both of them represent, right? You all with me? So you get, you get the idea. Now the question is, I've asked this, I don't know how many times over the course of my teaching career, has it to PhDs, I've asked it to you, because it, there's, a, there's deep, deep theology in this point, all right? And uh, the question is, can you give me, I remember I, I asked it to a guy who was a Jesuit, and was hostile to the particular theological point I was trying to develop. And I said, okay, let me ask you a question. And I basically put a form of this question to him. And he was stumped. I have to say, well, the one and only time in my life I've stumped a Jesuit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've had quite a few conversations with him over the years. And uh, so anyway, and they're tough to stump. Let me tell you, those guys are usually real bright. Here's the question. Can you give me an example of a choice where, you are, where your choice was not determined? A non-deterministic choice that you've made? Or can you give me a scenario where a person would choose against their strongest preference at the time they make the choice? Give me an example. So, that's my question to you. Can you do better than the Jesuit? That's my... Uh... So anyway, I want to give me... Uh, there's, usually, there's, there's usually several pretty good examples that are floated here as hypothetical um, possibilities. Can you think of any? Go ahead. Well, we can never truly desire God due to our sin nature. Okay, well now, we're not talking about desiring God. We're just talking about choosing according to your strongest inclination, whatever you choose at the moment, right? So I, I, I'm not trying to get theology into this, you know, this soon. Although you're seeing, I think, the implications. This is, this is obviously where it has to go. Anybody? I'll tell you the example, uh, maybe some of you are thinking of it, but uh, the example that usually is raised that sounds like it defeats the principle is this. What about, you know, this does happen, this happens in wartime and so on, where, you know, you got six guys, soldiers, uh, all together in a certain situation, battlefield scenario, and what happens? Anybody know the scenario that I'm going to paint here? What, what goes on, Avery? Somebody throws a grenade in. Yeah, yeah. And, and so? One guy, one guy jumps on it. That's right. And so that it explodes. And exactly. Guys don't so, you know, that does happen. Uh, that's, in fact, part of training. You are, your, your life, you will lay down your life for your comrades in arms, you know, and that's just something you're trained to and you do it. You don't, you can't think about it. There's a live grenade sitting there, you don't philosophize for a while. Hmm, should I lay down on that grenade or not? I mean, think about this, you know, because then you all go up. Uh, fragmentation there. So anyway, you know the deal. One guy, usually the guy closest to it, it's a live grenade, he throws his body on it, absorbs the explosion. Obviously he dies, but saves the lives. Isn't that an example of choosing against your strongest preference at the moment? For crying out loud, I mean, you know, doesn't that at least, if not others, doesn't that one at least prove that Augustine has to allow for an exception to the rule because, you know, this guy's just offered his life, and who could ever want to do that more than something else? Stephen. In that example, would your strongest preference still be to save the lives of your comrades rather than everybody die? Does anybody want to argue with Stephen? That would be Augustine's answer. Anybody want to take Stephen on here? Just to persuade you all. I don't know. I, I, I want to hear from you, Jake. I guess there's, I don't know, I can see two different ways to look at it. In one way you could say, 
either what Steven said, or you could say maybe he doesn't want to, he preferred not to be around or to live without his friends or to live with the guilt of not having saved his friends or the dishonor of not having done it. On the other hand, you can, might be able to say that it's just a physical reflex. That's right. And that, in that choice, in that option, there's not really any choice being made. Yeah. And maybe a choice was made a long time ago, but yeah. it's not really a okay. choice. Do either of those, uh, those are both good. It sounded like your first thought is simply really agreeing with Stephen for slightly different reasons. The second one is still a choice, isn't it? It's just a choice, like you said, that was a prior commitment. Um, yeah. Well, do you see the problem? I mean, it, it, at least you, you kind of see the problem. You're not, you're not debating this as strenuously as I've had sometimes students debate it. And I, because the implications are profound, you know. Um, in answer to this one, uh, you know, I, my response would be, it's, it's not, that is not even a tough scenario, the one that I just gave you, if you just think about it differently. I'm, I'm for example, a grandfather, all right, got 12 grandkids. Can you believe that? A young guy like me? <laughs> How do these things happen? It is my intent to overpopulate the world. I am planning to do it, and uh, so I'm working on it. Uh, so anyway, well, I love my 12 grandkids, every one of them. I love my four kids who were responsible for these 12 grandkids. And if you put me in a situation where you said, okay, Gore, it's either your life or one of those, you know what? That ain't even a choice. That's, I mean, that's like a no-brainer, you know? Is it my life or my granddaughter or my son or my daughter? Not only do I, I'm not going to weigh that decision, I mean, I'm just going to be jumping in, whatever it is, because I'm going to give my life for them, that's what I want to do, right? You see that? If you have kids, you'll be in the same position. In a sense, the soldier in the foxhole is, is just one more, you know, version of that same deal. Your love for your, you know, friends outweighs your desire to protect your life, so you're choosing according to your strongest inclination at the time. Your inclinations can change. You know, I think I talked about the other day, right before turkey dinner. I really want turkey dinner. Boy, that looks good. Right after turkey dinner, you know, doesn't look so good. So inclinations change based on your circumstance at the given moment. That's why the statement is, as Augustine put it, you always choose according to your strongest inclination at the time of the choice. Inclinations can change. All right. So um, we had two principles here. Is that, are you with me here? Is that, because this is a fairly important idea to get. It's pretty straightforward, but for some people it comes as not only shocking, but just horrifying. Because what I'm saying is that in the sense most people think of the term, there ain't no free will, according to Augustine. Your choices are determined. They are determined by you, by your desires. And you don't pick your desires, do you? you know. Right? I mean, the fact of the matter is, yesterday I had lunch and I had a piece of carrot cake. I mentioned that to you the other day. Carrot cake. I could have taken broccoli. Is it possible for Gore to say, I am not going to like broccoli more than I like carrot cake. Can you do that? I can choose broccoli because I see that it's going to help me preserve my sleek body. You're all supposed to go, oh yes, we see that. Yeah. Okay. He's not here. But we were going to give him five days, that's all. He's supposed to be back. He's taken five days, just a few off days in between. Okay. Speaking of people overpopulating the world, there he is. <laughs> They're having babies. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's not the kind of thing. 
In other words, Augustine is saying your choice, your, your desires, the kind of person you are and the desires you have are not things you just choose. You don't say, okay, I'm going to like broccoli more than carrot cake. It's just wired in. You know. You can't change your desires and your choices are determined by your desires. So that's his argument. And uh, it's a fairly uh, potent argument. All right, that was the two terms that we have of them, uh, liber arbitrium and libertas, right? That's where we left off. Liberty, you'll recall. Did, did I give you those two terms? You got those in your notes? Liber arbitrium, free will, which is the, defined as the ability to choose what you want. Libertas, critically important, the ability to want what is truly right. Read into that ability to want that which glorifies God. The truly virtuous thing. Not just right in some two-dimensional sense that it's protecting me from bad consequences. Right because it actually is to the glory of God. You know, you all are drivers, I assume. How many of you, as you're driving down the street, doing the speed limit, as I know you all do? As I do, of course. Driving the speed limit. How many of you are driving along? I know some of this is probably true for some of you, you know. But I want to know, you just answer this question in your own heart, how many of you, driving along, doing the speed limit, say to yourself, and have it in your mind sincerely, I'm driving the speed limit to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And how many are you just glancing in the rearview mirror to make sure there's not a cop, you know, in the neighborhood? You see? It's a very different issue, isn't it? Paul talks about, in Romans chapter 13, two reasons we obey the civil magistrate. One, he says, because the civil magistrate carries the sword. Well, that's a fairly good reason to obey him. He doesn't carry the sword for nothing. Speed, you get nailed. You know, whatever. And then he talks about obeying the magistrate for conscience. And what he means by that is obeying the civil magistrate because God is in heaven. And you're actually doing it to honor him. Well, Augustine understands that sometimes we can obey the rules, but we don't necessarily obey them for reasons that are heartfelt desires to glorify God. Libertas is the ability to want what is truly right. After the fall, you know, we have, I'll just abbreviate this, liber arbitrium, libertas. After the fall of Adam and Eve, he says, we lost libertas. Hence, according to Augustine, this is a secondary doctrine, up and down, deep into the pool, I'm just fair, you know, full disclosure. That's why, according to Augustine, Nobody ever, ever, ever chooses God because they've lost the ability to choose what is right. They are a slave at the point of their desires. And nobody desires God. They desire to get away from Him. You see. And so according to Augustine, the only reason anybody chooses God is because God changes them. God changes their desires which is that event that Augustine calls regeneration, changes the desires. It gives you the desire to want God, which desire you would never have had had not God changed you. Now, I'm, I'm, I sound like I'm arguing for Augustine, and I am, but I'm doing it because right now I'm representing Augustine, okay? And later, even in this conversation, I want to represent other points of view. Lest you think I'm trying to pound some sort of you know, secondary doctrine into your skulls, please be aware. I'm just doing this at the moment because this is the man I'm talking about. But do you all follow that? Do you all see the logic? I want you to all kind of follow it. The logic of Augustine is, you will always choose according to your strongest desire at the moment of the choice. Premise two, you lost the ability to desire God as a result of the fall. Premise three, you will never choose God, therefore, on your own. Premise four, therefore, the only reason you chose God is because God chose you first. And Augustine is the first robust, full-bodied 
predestinarian in the history of the church. You have other people kind of playing with it earlier. You know, nobody really jumps in and makes this argument. And he makes it in connection with the debate with Pelagius. You've got Pelagianism now, and now I hope you're kind of seeing the shape of Augustinianism and what his you know, thinking is. All right, comments, questions so far? A couple of more points on Augustine. This is kind of the most chewy point of his theology, so I want you to be sure to get it. So far, so good? Everybody's happy? Get it? You could defend it if you had to. Could you attack it? I'm going to try to give you the attack in just a moment. All right, point, what is this? Point number five? Point number cinque, numero cinque. This is a famous phrase from Augustine. It's one of the most famous lines in Augustine. A person's best deeds, their best deeds are but splendid vices. person's best deeds, those most virtuous acts, those things that would get the most praise of being self-sacrificial, just over the top virtue, Augustine says there's still a pound of flesh in them. That's another famous Augustinian phrase. There's not a pure motive in us. He would say, even you who are Christians, even I who am a Christian, are shot through with mixed motives. Part of us is doing things to the glory of God. Certainly that's true. God has changed our hearts, and there is a little bit of that spark of desire to please God in us. And yet how much of us is still touched by the flesh, as Paul says? And how much of my own motives? I have to say to you, you know, I, come to, I come to teach here at the Oaks, and I come into class, and I... I'd like to come off as this pure-hearted, true, blue, sincere Christian. If you could see my heart, you'd be horrified at what a hypocritical, duplicitous, you know, double-minded man I am. I'm just an actor. Do you understand that? You know, somebody says, the church is full of hypocrites. But yeah, you know, I'm first in line. But is it true of you? Or am I just the only one? I don't know. But Augustine looks in his heart and he sees that even when he's at his very best, you know, when people say, man, look at that guy. Whoa, he's just amazing in his devotion to God. Even then, Augustine knows his heart is just riddled with mixed motives, lusts, greed, desire, illegitimate, idolatry in various forms that are kind of in his psyche. All right, our best deeds are but splendid vices. Next one, this is usually the one, if, I, if nobody throws tomatoes at Augustine up until this point, this one is usually the one that gets the tomatoes in the air. I'm just the messenger. Just write it down, don't react. Let me explain. But here it comes. Infants are lost without grace. You understand it's always a big question, right? What happens to infants that die in infancy? Pelagius, of course, would say what? What happens to an infant that dies in infancy? What would be Pelagius' answer to that, Sydney? I think you think it's safe because we're born innocent. That's right. You know, infants are born into this world in the very same condition as Adam, innocent. No problem, heart of gold, haven't committed any sin, no taint, no guilt, no sin, no nothing. Infant dies in infancy, goes straight to heaven. That's Pelagius' view. Augustine says, without grace, infants are guilty, they deserve God's wrath. Without grace, they go straight to hell. Now, be careful. Augustine doesn't say, Infants go straight to hell. He doesn't say that. He says, and get this, this is the point, get this, understand it, that if God brings an infant that dies in infancy to heaven, that is not a function of his justice, that is a function of his mercy. 
follow that? He doesn't bring an infant to heaven because the infant deserves it, but because God is merciful. But it does kind of highlight the point, doesn't it? Infants are lost unless they receive that grace. Augustine's precise view of what happens to infants who die in infancy is somewhat uh, complicated. And uh, so, you know, I don't want you to misread what I'm saying here. I don't think he necessarily taught emphatically, at least I've never seen it in my readings of Augustine, that it's kind of automatic. If a child dies in infancy, automatically the child goes to heaven. Um, I think he would say, many do, most do, maybe all do, but I don't think he ever gets himself painted in the corner there. And it does have something to do with, you know, Christian parents and baptism and so on. And so I'm, I'm leaving all of that out. It's a more complicated view, but the fundamental idea here is, is clear enough, I hope. And then finally, uh, somewhat superfluously, I'll just give you the last point. The fall of the human race was, according to Augustine, a great fall. It was not just a little slip. David, I keep wanting to say, you're out of uniform. It, look, it looks so nice to have you over there. You know, you just look like you fit. And then I think, what are you doing out of uniform? And then I really want one. You got a special pass, right? Yeah. What's next for you? What, what happens next? Uh, oh, really? Good. Good for you. And that's going to start next like fall. next fall. Okay, great. Excellent. Well, then you can come back this time next year and tell us about New St. Andrews, right? <coughs> All right, so we've got the two extremes. We have talked about now Pelagius over here, Augustine over here. You've got a bunch of points for each. Any comments, questions? Those are the two extremes. I don't think in church history anybody has defined a view more extreme than Pelagianism on the one hand or Augustinianism on the other. These are the outer limits of Christian thought on this point. You do have people who are beyond Pelagius, but they're not Christians, all right? I'm just saying within the Christian tradition, I'm not even sure Pelagius qualifies as a Christian, but you know, at least within, at least, you know, arguably within the Christian tradition, Pelagius would be one extreme, Augustine would be the other. Then we have a ton of compromised views out there in the middle. So far so good? I'm gonna press on. All right, so the kind of middle point here that came along after the death of both Augustine and Pelagius was a view that was called semi-Pelagianism. Usually people say, how come it wasn't called semi-Augustinianism? And I don't know. But in church history, that's what it's been called, and I'm sticking to it. So if I kind of map this out, Pelagius says, morally speaking, you are well. Right? Augustine says, morally speaking, you are what? Class? Dead. Semi-Pelagiusism says, morally speaking, you are sick. We covered something of this last year, didn't we? This is a little bit familiar? Okay. So, I don't mean to be too much of reruns, but I don't think we went through the whole detail of it last year. I think it was kind of a quickie. Yeah. All right, uh, you'll be happy to know there are four points in semi-Pelagianism, only four. Uno, due, tre, quattro. Number one. Semi-Pelagianism says grace is the external prerequisite to salvation. Grace is the external prerequisite to salvation. Mr. Dupree, 
Does that point of semi-Pelagianism sound more like Augustine or more like Pelagius? Which way does that point tilt on our little spectrum here? I'm going to take a guess here. Augustine and just go with them. Um, Pelagius. All right, there we go. Man took a guess. He flipped a coin. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. Matthew, what do you think? Do you agree with uh, Mr. Dupree or do you disagree? This point says grace is the external prerequisite to salvation. Does that sound more like Augustine or Pelagius? Um, sounds more like Augustine. Ah, so now we have a difference. Go ahead, defend your view. Pelagius says that we're already good, so I don't know if we really need grace. All right. You want to respond to that, or are you going to fold? <laughs> well, that's right. You weren't here, weren't you? So you're not getting the full benefit of Spencer, you were going to weigh in on this? I agree with Matt. Okay. Good. Thank you. Matt's a good man. That's good. Jake? I agree with <laughs> it is an emotional moment, I know, and it brings, it brings me to tears myself. <laughs> I think that with Pelagianism, you, grace just makes it easier for you. Yeah. And so with, and then with Augustine, you would have said that you actually need it. Okay, so. excellent, that's right. Back to... You mentioned something <coughs> Day today, so I think we should sing to it. It's Jake's birthday. Yeah. That's what I'm and you didn't show up with brownies, cupcakes, yeah. uh, you know? What is this? It's the Monday after Thanksgiving. This is actually a treat for you not to have brownies. <laughs> See? Good, good. But All right. If we could sing to him at some point, that would Yes. Be uh, I'll tell you what, Spencer, if you would be kind enough to. Remind me of that about two minutes before the end of All class. Right. All right. All right. Okay. Matt is correct. Uh, this point, sorry. Grace is the external prerequisite. That is to say, no. according to semi-Pelagianism, nobody can be saved without grace. You cannot be saved without grace. It is the external prerequisite, meaning it's got to come to you from outside, and unless it comes to you from outside, there's no way you can be saved. That sounds like Augustine, right? This is a view that's trying to tip its hat in both directions. It's trying to give Augustine his due, but also allow for a Pelagian you know, perspective. Number two, grace is not necessary to make a start toward salvation. Who does that sound like? Like, duh. Who does it sound like? Pelagius. Pelagius. And why? Why would you say that? Because he believed in a kind of a workspace, like you could okay. become good or whatever. All right, good. And he believed in free will, and he could believe you could just choose it. You could want it and choose it. Yeah. Uh, number three, semi-Pelagianism, predestination is understood in light of what's called prescience. Prescience, P R E, and then science. The other word that you'll sometimes hear, fundamentally synonymous with this, is foreknowledge. Okay. So, remember, I mean, predestination is in play all the way through. Augustus, or Pelagius rejects any idea. He says, you know, that it's basically your choice, and your choice is absolutely freely determined by your will. Augustine is thoroughly predestinarian. He would say, no one seeks for God. You know, we all got out of the way. We are God-haters, and that the only reason anybody chooses God is because God sovereignly intervenes, interrupts their life, changes their heart, and then they want God. So there you got it. Uh, this view takes what appears to be at least a kind of compromise position that the word predestination, which is a biblical word, they want to accommodate the Bible more than Pelagius seemed to, the Bible uses that term, is understood in light of God's foreknowledge. What does that mean? Can anyone explain that 
concept. Jordan, any idea? What do you think is the, explain in your own words, the idea of predestination understood in light of prescience or foreknowledge? Well, I could be thinking of something else, but isn't it that the idea that God looked into the kind of looked into the future mm -hmm. and saw that we chose him, mm -hmm. so he chooses us. Okay, precisely. Y'all, I assume we've all kind of heard that theology. And that would be classical semi-Pelagianism. So God looks, you know, here's God in eternity. He's looking at the entire human race. There everybody is. Here's, you know, uh, Jordan. Here's Kayla. Here's Jacob over here. Here's uh, Trevor. Here's Gore. Several others out here. And uh, so, you know, all the people that have ever lived in human history are there in the mind of God. Right? And God is contemplating them. By the way, you realize, of course, that most of the people that have ever lived in human history are alive right now. You know that, don't you? Which is an interesting idea, isn't it? But uh, I don't know what that has to do with this. Anyway, God is looking at the entire human race from the perspective of eternity, and he looks out and he sees, oh, there's Josiah Finn. And look at Josiah's going to choose me. Oh, and there, look at there, there's Kaylee. That was Kayla, actually. I know, I changed this. There's Kayla. Well, there's Kayla over there. I changed this. Mr. Gore. Oh, that's right. What do you think? I don't need this. All right, there's Kaylee, there's Kayla. Gore's, he's. He's out of the pool, man. He's so, you know. All right. So, God looks down through history and says, look at there. That person's going to choose me when they're presented with the gospel. That person's going to choose me when they're presented with the gospel. That person's going to choose me, so I am going to choose them. And God's choice of them is subject to their choice of him. All right. That's the, that's the idea. Yes, doesn't that contradict his first point, however, because isn't grace God choosing us? Isn't that the definition? No, that would be Augustine's definition, but he means something else by grace. Think of grace in the semi-Pelagian perspective as help. Help that you can either accept or reject. This becomes more clear with Arminianism, which we look at next. Jordan. Who's the main uh, champion? You know, there really isn't a main champion. Uh, I, that's a great question. I wish I could give you one. But semi-Pelagianism sort of just began as a movement. And there's, there are several names that are, none of them are great thinkers. None of them are people we'd otherwise ever care about. So I, I just want you to know the position. You know. Um, yeah, good question. All right. We are going to uh, hold up right there. Because